Today, Sarah Catholic High School presents the 2021 Jespy Awards. Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2021 inaugural Jespy Awards. We are here tonight to celebrate Jay Sarah's athletic history, Jay Sarah's current student athletes, and Jay Sarah's community. I've asked Jay Sarah's president, Rich Meyer, to come up here and lead us in prayer. Thank you, Mr. Ledyard, and what an awesome inaugural event here. And it's good to know that there's no COVID here at J. Sarah Catholic High School, so it's good to see you guys out. Why don't we bow our heads here as we begin this inaugural event. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord in heaven, we are so very, very grateful for the opportunity to come together here tonight as a school community to honor those who have gone before us who have brought much pride and joy to the JCR name, but ultimately through their accomplishments and through their application of the talents that you've given them, have helped JCRA via our teams, via our players, give great glory to you. We ask Lord that we can continue to center everything that we do in you and that this event and the recognition of the teams, the individuals, the coaches who have built this legacy of JCRA Catholic High School in a very short period of time can continue to give all glory to you as we shine our light on a hill for this country, for our state, and for this world. And through Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Father and the Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. The 2020-21 academic year has been historic, but it's also been heroic. Scripture tells us that without a vision, the people perish. We all know this. Without a vision, the people perish. We know it instinctively. So all of us have felt the loneliness and randomness of being informed of the need to shut down until further notice. The members of this school follow the necessary guidelines as imperfectly as the human race does. And simultaneously, the members of this school have intentionally developed methods of keeping the vision alive. Siempre adelante, always forward. Never has this mantra meant so much to the JCR community. Heroic, heroic is the right word to describe what has happened here with JCR athletics. Heroic began with a new mantra for us the great and wonderful Donald Evans suggested that we use the mantra, connect and condition to keep our sports teams alive this year, to keep our student athletes moving forward. Connect and condition became the useful and accurate way to describe the invention of training high school athletic teams half online and half live with masks on, too bizarre too true. Each week or each month, depending on the national outlook as described by our country's news outlets, we planned and waited for the next step. 
And then we planned and waited again. And then we planned with new plans and scrapped the old ones. And then we waited again. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. For about eight or nine months, you know the routine. What you might not know is how many coaches created their own lesson plans from online motivational speakers to the student athletes to a year's worth of strength and conditioning skills. And the student athletes kept coming, not knowing whether they would get to compete against another school. That's extraordinary. And then we started hearing different news. Certain sports might be able to compete. Fall season of sports might move to the winter season and the winter season on top of the spring and the hip bones connected to the thigh bone and the thigh bones connected to the knee bone, blah, blah, blah. And then the final decision was made. Why don't we play a few fall sports in the winter and then 21 sports simultaneously in the spring. Oh, and let's allow football to play a season with an end date of April 16th, because that way we can get the home opener for football on the same day as the home opener for baseball. Awesome. Why is this important? Why am I talking about this? Because our coaches are heroes because our student athletes are heroes, because the school administrators and the teachers, the athletic administrators, the facility guys, the security teams, and the staff at J. Sarah Catholic High School have been heroic, valiant, and relentless in their work ethic amidst this pandemic. This night and this weekend is a celebration of all of you who entertain this insane vision, which is playing out in front of us right now in spite of the circumstances that have surrounded us. So at this point, I wanna ask every J. Sarah coach and every J. Sarah teacher to please stand. So we're gonna share a lot of great moments tonight and we're gonna to see some great awards and some wonderful things. But allow me to share with you some of the moments that have happened with our teams that may not be winning an award tonight, but are highlights of this crazy season nonetheless. Boys soccer Trinity League runner ups, boys tennis team in the championships tomorrow. Baseball, two no hitters this season. Danny Day became a Trinity League champion in the boys tennis. Softball, still making a run in the CIFs. Kenny Ariola ran a record-breaking 413 mile in the indoor track season. Girls volleyball, tied for third in the Trinity League with three freshman starters. They had a whopping four games this year. And the current CIF runs right now at J. Sarah are boys basketball, boys tennis, Softball, girls lacrosse, baseball, boys and girls golf, track and field and swim and dive. As we celebrate very specific people and events tonight, please note that the people of J. Sarah Catholic High School Athletics are proud of all those who participate in this transformational vision of sports properly directed. And now please turn your attention to the screens. Do you have what it takes to last? For Steve Berline, competition is a way of life. For 17 years, Steve played the game of football at the highest level on the fields of the National Football League. Along the way, he enjoyed the thrill of victory and tasted the bitterness of defeat. For every completed pass or touchdown toss, there was a knockdown, sack, or interception not far away.
Over the span of his career, Steve suffered many devastating hits, dozens of injuries, and 18 operations. But no matter how many times Steve Berline was knocked down, he got back up. If he threw an interception, he was back in the huddle ready to lead his team down the field for a score. Steve is one of only nine quarterbacks in NFL history to throw for more than 4,000 yards and 30-plus touchdowns in a single season, a performance that was rewarded with a trip to the NFL Pro Bowl. 17 years, hundreds of touchdowns, and thousands of yards later, Steve has proven he has what it takes to last. Do you? Burline under center. Floyd goes in motion right. Burline takes the snap. He's going to run it himself. 2-1. Yeah! Touchdown! <laughs> Burline wins it! Burline wins it! <laughs> Burline on the quarterback draw, and the Panthers have won it! Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Steve Burline. Thank you very, very much. Welcome to the first annual J. Sarah Jespy Awards. Let's give everybody a round of applause. What a great setting. What a great environment. I mean, look around you. Look how beautiful. Can you believe this is the first ever an event coming together like this tonight? Absolutely spectacular. You got to tip your hat to the all the volunteers that made this possible. The only one thing that I have a complaint about is that I have to wear this very ugly colored jacket that I know signifies a lot to Jay Sarah, but to me as a Notre Dame grad, it reminds me of another local college that a lot of people keep bringing up tonight. And that's a four letter word in my vocabulary, by the way, wears this color down the street and too many of you Trojan people are here, but guess what? We can coexist. We can coexist tonight for the J. Sarah Lions and for the Jespy Award. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, when Chris Ledyard uh, asked me if I had any kind of an intro video to show uh, to kind of help with the introduction, uh, I said I, I had this video that was made probably, it was actually made right about 2010, and it was made by Merrill Lynch. I was doing a speaking uh, series down in the southeast. I was living in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time. And I was doing a speaky, speaker series uh, for all the Merrill Lynch branches in that part of the country. If you all remember, coming out of 2009, 2010, that was the middle of a recession uh, where the whole country was going through a very, very difficult time uh, trying to figure out what was in front of us. And they thought the theme of that, you know, when you get knocked down, you've got to find a way to get back up. That would be appropriate for that time. Well, when I explained it to Chris, he said, you know what? We're going through the same kind of thing right now. That's a message that Jay Sarah has tried to employ a message that Jay Sarah has tried to commit to, and it's a message that our country really needs to, to rally behind too. It's time to get back up on our feet, and I think Jay Sarah is doing a fantastic job right now leading the way. So give yourselves a, a round of applause. I know personally, my I have a brother that lives up in uh, Palos Verdes, and just 45 minutes down the 405 freeway, it's a whole different world. And I think we all need to recognize and realize how lucky we are to be able to do this kind of event and have the kind of year and have the kind of experience this year for our kids and for everybody involved with Jay Sarah, because just 45 minutes up the road, I've got a brother who has two kids that haven't been to school in over a year. And they didn't get to experience a, a full school year like our students here were able to experience. And it's caused a lot of problems. A lot of people are hurt and a lot of people are suffering. But I can tell you right now, I am proud to be a lion, to be a lion parent. And we should all be very excited about that, uh, to be part of this incredible school. A lot of the things that uh, Chris Ledyard said in his uh, opening comments, I think apply. Uh, to me, the words that really jump out are resilience, toughness and leadership that's what this school has shown throughout this whole process 
and it starts at the very top with Tim Bush and the Bush family. It starts with the president, Mr. Meyer, his incredible leadership with Chris Ledyard on the athletic side of things, the principal, Mr. Stroop. Uh, but it goes much further than that. There are so many more people that are responsible for us being here tonight and for our kids having the experience that they had this year. You got to talk about all of the teachers and all of the coaches. Think about what's going on in other parts of the country right now with teachers and school unions and uh, not wanting to go back to school for whatever their personal reasons might be. Our teachers and our coaches came back for our kids and they deserve a round of applause for that. But most important, most important of all, and I think I speak for all the parents here, we are so proud of our kids for fighting through this incredibly difficult time. No generation of kids in my lifetime has ever been through a challenge that you kids have had to go through this last year and a half. And the way that you've approached it and the way that you've accepted every challenge along the way, you are so tough, you are so committed, and you should be commended for how you've handled yourselves through this whole ordeal. And I wanna tip my hat to you and say thank you for being a great example to us parents. You, all you students deserve recognition for that. So, having gotten through that, let's get ready to have some fun. This is gonna be a fantastic night. Uh, what I wanna say before we start with the initial Hall of Fame inductee class of Jay Sarah, is I want to tell each of the award winners, the recipients tonight that come up on the stage, we'd like to ask you to come down the red carpet, uh, enter the stage here, stage left, your right, obviously, come up and receive your award, and then you'll walk off the right side back here, and they'll take some photos back here behind stage. But it will make for a more efficient process if everybody comes up that way and then exits off to the right. So it's time to introduce our first Hall of Fame class in the history of J. Sarah Catholic High School. This is exciting. A J. Sarah Catholic, at J. Sarah Catholic High School, we continue to mature, and it's time to begin our recognition of the past. The Hall of Fame is an opportunity to acknowledge the early members of our community who helped J. Sarah and who helped Lion Nation to play a critical role by playing a critical role in the overall development of the athletic programs here at J. Sarah and the school as a whole. Today, we honor the first class of Hall of Famers and pay tribute to all they did and all they gave to the Crimson and Gold. Tonight's inductions will be shared duties of our principal, Eric Stroop, and of our assistant athletic director, who just recently won the Trinity League, I believe, our head baseball coach, Brett Kay. They'll be up here. Yeah, give them a round of applause. So first up to introduce our inaugural Hall of Famer, the first ever Hall of Famer in the history of J. Sarah Catholic High School. Mr. Eric Stroop will come up for that first person. Come on up, Mr. Stroop. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Well, Steve said it well. I think when you think about our, our, our award winners tonight, our Hall of Fame recipients tonight, he used the words leadership, toughness, and resilience. And I think all seven honorees tonight really are emblematic of those words and represent those words well. So the first person that I'm going to talk about is Danny DeCorpo. Danny was a multi-sport athlete at J. Sarah, as a lot of our students were in our first years. And I had the good fortune of being at J. Sarah since the very beginning, so I remember her as both a student and an athlete. And she competed in the varsity level at J. Sarah in volleyball, basketball, and softball. She was a hustler in every athletic venue that she participated in. She was not blessed with incredible size, but she certainly played like a tiger, and she backed down to no one and to no challenge. I most vividly remember her in basketball because I helped coach girls basketball in her early years. She was a sharp shooter from outside, but I, re I most remember her tenacious defense. She moved well laterally and was very active as both an individual and team defender and was very rarely out of position. 
She also aggressively rebounded despite not being very tall. She was also super smart and was never out of position on offense or defense. Her fundamentals were very solid. She could handle the ball as she needed to. She had good shooting form and she had solid footwork. She was a terrific teammate in the locker room, always positive, always encouraging her teammates, even when we were outmatched. She was a really strong student as well, often setting the curve for her academic classes. And I know, and I know that because I also taught her. So in this sense, she was an ideal representative of a J. Sarah student athlete. I'm very honored to give our first Hall of Fame inductee award to Miss Danny DeCorpo, who is also soon to be married in a couple of weeks. So congratulations, Danny. Please come up and receive your award. I'm not tall. It is such an honor to be nominated into this Hall of Fame. It took many teachers, coaches, friends, family, and my faith to help see me through my time at J. Sarah. If it wasn't for their support, I never would have made it through all the sports, classes, clubs, and everything else it took to get a school up and running. Because it was a whirlwind of a four years, especially because we didn't have any athletic facilities for the majority of them. We not only had to practice off-site, thanks to Mr. Spaziri for giving us that space, but we had to travel hours on end on a school night just to play one single game. So imagine 12 girls packed in a van trying to pass the time by singing Hollaback Girl and Spice Girls for the majority of the duration. So you kind of start feeling bad for all our drivers, which included my dad and Mr. Stroop, who I'm sure remembers those journeys very fondly. We had to recruit people who had never played the sport just to have enough bodies to compete. Some of us played on JV and varsity at the same time because we barely could make two teams. We had to make a name and an impression in a world that didn't have any idea who J. Sarah was or what J. Sarah stood for. I wouldn't have changed it for the world. It made our senior year that much sweeter when we finally got our gym, our fields and other facilities, and we finally started competing in the Trinity League against the best of the best. Being part of J. Sarah's beginnings, being part of that grind, the literal sweat and tears, because there was a lot of them, those are the things you never forget. And there's no doubt J. Sarah was extremely instrumental in me growing into the person I am today and the path I took moving out of high school and into adulthood. So I wanna thank all those who helped shape our legacy the first four years, all those after us who continue to build up our legacy and all the students and faculty to come who will continue our legacy in the future. I am extremely thankful and happy to have just attended this great school. And now I'm very grateful and honored to be part of its Hall of Fame. So thank you. Congratulations, Danny. And as uh, Mr. Berline said, we get the honor of having the Trinity League champion head coach, Brett Kay, introduce our next award winner. Brett. I feel like this is a Bill and Ted's excellent adventure moment where I want to yell, San Dimas football rocks. but. Not gonna do that tonight. Although I think it'd be really cool. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stroop. Um, I am Brett Kay. I'm the assistant athletic director and head baseball coach. Um, newly minted Trinity League champions for baseball. So you baseball guys, if you guys had a chance to attend last night, that was the best atmosphere I've seen in my 15 years here. Tonight, I am honored to induct the second entry into the JCR Athletics Hall of Fame, Austin Hedges, class of 2011.
Austin came to us in the fall of 2008 as an accelerated young man in sport and in academics. He would become a four-year starter for the Lions and a part of our first 2009 Trinity League Championship team. Austin would garner Trinity League MVP his sophomore year. Hedgie would go on and win his second MVP of the Trinity League his senior year. Also being named a two-time All-American, National Defensive Player of the Year twice, which is by Rawlings, which is awarded to the best defensive player in the country for high school baseball. Austin had committed to UCLA out of high school, but the draft came calling, where the San Diego Padres drafted him in the second round, 82nd overall, where he decided to sign for $3 million. So on to professional baseball he went. Currently, Austin is in his sixth year in the big leagues and is now regarded as one of the highest defensive catching prospects in the bigs. He is now with the Cleveland Indians. Austin was and is still is a transcendent of a student athlete as we have had on this campus. He was talented not only on the baseball field, but off of it. One of those rare, rare students that helps cultivate what we now call Jay Sarah and what I like to call Jay Sarah baseball. He was the first player to have his number retired in our program, number 11. Tonight, Austin, we honor you with this induction to the Hall of Fame. I'm going to accept this on behalf of Austin because he went 0 for 3 today, so I wasn't allowed him to come. Um, so I apologize for that. And if you saw what he looks like, he, he looks like he lives in the 70s. So also my apologies. So he is in the midst of his season, and I'll accept this award on his behalf. And he has a message for us that should be playing shortly. Hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be inducted into Jay Sayers' first Hall of Fame class. I have so many, th so many people I want to thank. Uh, but specifically, Brett Kay, Damon Summers, the coaches I had. Uh, they meant so much in my life and helped prepare me for the real world fresh out of high school. I just want to remind everybody that one of the main things that Jay Sarah taught me was how to balance my academics with my athletics. The academics are such a big part of life and taught me how to be more disciplined in life. So I just want to challenge everybody to stick with academics. And if you're playing sports, work hard every single day and you never know where life's going to take you. I'll call back up to the uh, podium, uh, Principal Eric Stroop. Thank you, Brett. Our third inductee tonight is Joseph Capoletti. Joe was a, yeah, very, let's give him a hand. And you might recognize the name. Uh, his, his dad was a Heisman Trophy winner, but I think his mother is the real success story in the family. She's our Dr. Capoletti who runs our Magna program. Joe, or Joey as we called him back in the day, was a multi-sport athlete for all four years at J. Sarah. He played football, basketball, and then we added lacrosse either in his junior or senior year and he picked up lacrosse too. Like Danny, Joey was never the biggest kid on the field, certainly not in stature, but he, he certainly had the biggest heart. And he gave it his all in every single part of every game that he played in. He just had a tremendous motor. I will always remember him most for his senior year in football. That summer, we had just been placed into the Trinity League after having played our first three years as a school, as an independent school. And we were generally playing really, really small schools, but in our fourth year, we were placed into the Trinity League. A lot of the football players at that time were concerned about joining the Trinity League, just given how small we were as a school. In fact, I think all of the seniors of that team quit before the season began with the lone exception being Joey. And that was such an indication of the courage and the fortitude and his indeed oh, his overall character. On the football field, he never came off the field. We certainly took our licks that year, but Joe set the tone for future players in terms of what J. Sarah football was all about. We were gonna play hard, even though we were outsized. He was just one tough football player. He was never a rah-rah guy, 
but he definitely was a leader by his actions. In basketball, Joe again wasn't a superstar, but he was one pest of a defender with his nonstop game, his nonstop engine, and his great conditioning that he would use to apply defensive pressure to the opposing team's best player. In lacrosse, Joe relied on his terrific hand-eye coordination to, the, uh, to become the team's leading scorer as that program was just getting off the ground. He also brought to the team a level of toughness that was formed on the football field. He was just a terrific all-around athlete. Had he been four or five inches taller, I'm sure he would have had D1 schools all over him. Joe also won J. Sarah's most prestigious award, which we call our J. Sarah Award. We give out a graduation every year. It's the award that basically says this student represents the best values of our school. And that is, that is in fact what Joe is. He represents the best of J. Sarah. He's serious about his faith. He's serious about his school. And he's serious about academics or his athletics. So we're very honored to reward Joey tonight with this Hall of Frame recognition. Joey Capaletti. <laughs> Thank you. It's very humbling to be selected for this honor. I'd like to start by thanking my wife, my parents, and my family here tonight. It's because of all of you that I'm the man I am today. To my parents, I still remember sitting in the family room, having the conversation about which high school that I would go to. You very easily could have sent me to the same rival Trinity League school that my three older brothers attended. But choosing J. Sarah is one of the best decisions that I've made. It gave me the flexibility to play multiple sports. It allowed me to forge my own path and it introduced me to the family of my closest friends and wife. When I first received the call about tonight, one of the first people I thought of was my dad. As many of you know, my mom is a teacher here and started the medical magnet program. What you might not know is my brother actually wrote the school's alma mater. And now I stand up here tonight. So it really begs the question, when's my dad gonna start pulling his weight? <laughs> if you didn't get that joke, it actually makes it better for those of us that did. In all seriousness, in accepting this honor, I would like to do so on behalf of the first four years of J. Sarah. For two plus years, as Danny said, we'd look across and see dirt and construction fencing. Each day was an adventure on where and how we would get to practice. Whether it was the local elementary school field or any open gym, every student, parent, teacher, and coach had to make sacrifices. To me, it's these first years that form the bones of the powerhouse J. Sarah we see today. So on behalf of those early years, thank you and have a good night. I'd like to again welcome Coach K back up to the podium. Thank you, Mr. Stroop. Tonight I am honored to induct the fourth entry into the JCR Athletics Hall of Fame. Dante Pettis, class of 2014. Being this is my 15th year, I remember watching Dante play, and he was a four-sport four student athlete, but I remember one specific play that I believe it was actually played at, at Mission Viejo High School, and I remember watching that play and how graceful Dante was, and I remember saying or thinking to myself at that time that Jay Sarah football had arrived, and for the next two or three years, I, I just continued to watch in amazement of how graceful an athlete this kid was uh, and how unique his ability was uh, for our school and for our sport programs. 
Dante was and obviously still is a celebrated athlete. Dante competed in four sports in his time here at J. Sarah. Those sports included football, basketball, track and field, and he dabbled in baseball his freshman year. I know Gary's here, so if you know Gary's story, he's one of the best angels of all time. So I, I would like Dante to play baseball a little bit longer. So I apologize, Gary, if I say that publicly. In track and field, Pettis was a CIF champion and state finalist in the long jump. He still holds a school record in the long jump, the triple jump, and the 200 meters. In football, Pettis was an all-league and all-Orange County performer his junior and senior year. Pettis' senior season, he had 50 receptions for 889 yards and 11 touchdowns. Dante was heavily recruited and opted to attend the University of Washington, where he dazzled the nation as both a wide receiver and a punt returner. In 2018, Pettis was awarded the Jet Award as the nation's top return specialist. He was named first team All-American by four different publications. Pettis ended up breaking the NCAA record for most career punt returns for a touchdown in a career with nine. Dante was drafted 44th overall by the San Francisco 49ers. In his season debut with the 49ers, Dante had two catches for 61 yards and a touchdown. Currently, Dante is with the New York Giants. Coach McKnight had this to say about Dante during his time at J. Sarah. And I quote, Dante Pettis helped put J. Sarah football on the map. He was a true triple threat as a special teamer, wide receiver, and defensive back who made exciting plays in all three phases of the game. He is the first J. Sarah football lion to get drafted and one heck of a young man. Tonight we honor Dante Pettis and to accept this award while Dante is on training with the Giants is his father, Gary Pettis. First of all, I just want to thank everyone that had a big part in making this uh, special event and also a special high school. Uh, when you send your kids off to school, it's, it's a little scary because you don't know what to expect. Uh, and especially uh, when Jay Sarah was uh, first talked about, it was really hard to say, okay, I want to send my kids to Jay Sarah. And I believe at the time, all they had was the junior and senior classes. Uh, my daughter and her class, I think, was the first four-year class to attend J. Sarah. And 16 years later, four kids have gone through J. Sarah, and I'm really happy that they did. We, we had the... When we first told our friends that our kids were going to go to J. Sarah, we got the, the usual questions, why? Well, why? Because we wanted them to go somewhere where they could grow and grow into their own person and not follow what someone else did. And Jay Sarah took the lead, and uh, I think you see the results. Uh, Dante started on the, on the football field long before he got to Jay Sarah. He, he, was a, he was a Jay Sarah student long before he got here. Uh, one day, my daughter came home, and she said, Dad, you know, we had a... Uh, we had a football camp at J. Sarah today, and Dante, he attended the camp, and I think at the time he may have been in the third or fourth grade. And yeah, so uh, during the camp, I guess he did a bunch of great things with the third and fourth graders so much that the kids that went to J. Sarah that were running the camp said, hey, you know, let's, let's put him up here with the eighth graders and the ninth graders. And I was like, well, I guess he did so well then uh, I mean, he did so well in that group that they started calling him the beast and he was only in the <laughs> third or fourth grade. So little to say, Dante starred on the same field long before he did, uh, before he got to J. Sarah High School. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to, to say that I'm a, a, a J. Sarah parent. Thank you.
We have a message, a video uh, board message from Dante. What's going on, everybody? Dante Pettis here, class 2014. Sorry I couldn't make it tonight. Um, I had to go back to New York for our practices, but I was happy that I could at least send a video in just to say thank you and just how grateful I am to be part of this inaugural Hall of Fame class. Um, I couldn't have done this without you know, my family, God, um, a lot of the a lot of the faculty at J. Sarah helped me out a lot. Um, and I know there's a lot of really cool people being inducted into the Hall of Fame too. And I actually remember watching some of them play when I was younger. Uh, they were in high school and just thinking like, man, I, I want to be like that. I want to make the same impact that that they have. Uh, you know. So when I talk to parents, even some high schoolers sometimes, um, I get asked a lot for advice on how to play their sport at the next level or even just how to like pick the right college and it's hard because every situation is different uh, but you know something that I think I learned that isn't necessarily situation dependent is just trying new things uh, you have an abundance of opportunity at J. Sarah there's so many people that will help you out with whatever it is that you're into or thinking about doing um, they will definitely push you and help you get to where you want to be. Uh, I always say if you're afraid to try something, that probably means that you should be trying it. There's some, there's a reason why you're holding back. And um, if you're able to break through that, I mean, the world is yours. Uh, if, if things don't turn out, if you try something new and things don't turn out the way that you wanted them to, at least you'll have learned a bunch of new skills. Um, you, know, you can learn you know, courage or hard work, creativity, the list goes on. Um, you know, just try something new and dive into it. Don't hold back. The second thing I would say is to just keep God first. It's, it sounds fairly simple. It's easy to say, but it's also really easy to forget. Um, life will throw things at you in the next couple years that you can't even imagine right now, both good and bad. But I think the best way to just keep, you know, handle everything, kind of keep steady is just to keep God first. Um, if you forget for a little bit, it's all right. Once you remember, just put him back first. There's going to be things that come up and it'll be slipping. God will be moving down, but always just remember to put him back first. Um, so like I said, very sorry that I couldn't be there with you guys tonight. I wish I was there to celebrate. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your night. God bless and go Lions. That's great. Keep God first. What a, what a great message from a great young man. Our first team inductee to the J. Sarah Hall of Fame is our 2010 boys soccer team. Let's give him a round of applause. This was the first J. Sarah team sport to win a CIF championship. The prior year, in 2009, they won the Trinity League championship despite really being the new kid on the block in the league. In 2010, they repeated and were dominant, going with a record of 25-2 and 25-5 and 2. The 2010 boys soccer team was led by Juan Crabby Gutierrez, who earned Orange County Player of the Year and CIF Division I Player of the Year. Crabby finished the year with 51 points and 12 goals, with 12 of those goals coming in league play. The 2010 Lions also had five first-team all-leaguers in Sean Hudnall, Frankie Bastone, Jonathan Canales, Lucas Delorso, and Crabby Gutierrez. They also had three second-team all-leaguers in Dylan Seedman, Kyle Pierce, and Mitch Gonzalez. The team played hard-nosed physical soccer with an almost impenetrable back line but also artists and forward who could put the ball in the back of the net every game. Their path to their first CAF championship was really difficult as we were playing in the Division I, which is the most difficult league for CAF in soccer. We had close victories against Aliso Niguel, Huntington Beach, Esperanza, which we beat in penalty kicks, Northwood in the semifinals 2-0, but then we, we uh, finished off our championship season with a 2-1 victory over Harvard-Westlake. Teams tend to take on the personality of their coach. 
and that was certainly true of their coach, Devor Fabulich. Devor demanded that his players play as a team and that they play hard the entire game. They also played with a sense of confidence and fearlessness that shows their, their, usual, their usually mild-mannered coach could light a fire underneath them when needed. I'm gonna invite the entire team to come up and I think Devor's got some words for the crowd, but let's give a hand to the 2010 boys soccer team CAF champions. covered most of it my speech <laughs> okay so anyway guys uh, I want to thank Jay Sarah for acknowledge I mean uh, introducing us to the Hall of Fame and and uh, these guys really worked hard and deserved uh, this award I would say uh, I remember the first first day that uh, first practice we ran up to that hill and we said uh, I want to get rid of this uh, we said basically this is look at looking at these great facilities. We said this is where we're gonna win a championship guys and First year we had we had nine or ten freshmen but we tried to get into the uh, freshman tournament tournament in Capitol Valley and uh, I Think they almost kicked us out because we had a really good freshman team <laughs> uh, uh, The first first year basically we ended up winning one Trinity League game and tying one Trinity League game uh, and I think it was both against Sellers Lutheran. Second game, second year, the, the team ended up winning uh, the Trinity League Championship, their second year as sophomores. Uh, the rest of the team stepped up with some of the freshmen. And, uh, you know, third year, we ended up winning. Uh, oh, yeah, the goal when we were up top of the hill, guys, I forgot to mention this. I'm not following my notes. Uh, we were talked about putting the first banner in our gym. And we said, someday we can come back and we can look at our banner flying up in the gym. And that was our goal, to get the first Trinity League cha championship into the, uh, into the gym. Um, and one, someday we're gonna come back and, and, and see, see it. Well, Jay Sarah, thank you for this because this is a lot more than we, we expected. Really appreciate that. <clears throat> Uh, the second second year, uh, the, the third year, we ended up repeating as Trinity League champions and winning a CIF championship, which was the first CIF championship also for the uh, Division I CIF championship for the school. Uh, we, we had a lot of nominees for uh, uh, all, all league. All, we had a lot of all league and all CIF players, like uh, Eric, you mentioned all the names. Uh, but well, one, one I can recognize, you can recognize this one, uh, Juan Gutierrez. Uh, he was actually the only Californian that you mentioned, only Californian that, that made an All-American for that year. So, it was a, what, what a player. We had six, six guys go, go to play college, Division I. Got Frankie Bastone. We have uh, uh, Jonathan uh, Canales. We had... Uh, yeah, uh, Eric Seedman played a Loyola. We had we had um, Dylan Seedman played it, played at Loyola. We had uh, Lucas Delorso and uh, Kelsey Bakersfield. We had we had uh, Wazulski went back east and played soccer, college soccer. Am I missing anyone, guys? Is that it? <laughs> okay, there's some great great memories that I remember. Great memories playing uh, 
you know, playing in the rain for the CIF championship. And the, the ride after winning, the ride back on the bus was pretty crazy. And I can, these guys can testify for that. We stopped at In-N-Out on the way back to school. And uh, Mikey the other day said, Coach, that's still the best In-N-Out burger that I've ever had. Uh, another thing that comes to mind is Luis challenged me in a 50 yard, 50 yard dash. And I didn't warm up. <laughs> these guys were already warmed up. So halfway through, I pop, I tore my hammy. <laughs> and I, as I look back, I, I look back, I was limping. By the way, he was behind me when that might have happened. And uh, so I look back at my team, and they were all rolling on the ground. <laughs> they were laughing. Uh, and I was in pain. I couldn't help. I, I had to, I was laughing myself. It was, it was, uh, sticks in my mind. Okay. Uh, anyway, guys, thank you very much. Again, I want to thank uh, Pete Manorino for hiring me. He was the athletic director that was here. Uh, Coach Nick Chuchuk that helped me win a couple championships with these guys. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, again, thank you, Jay Sarah. Uh, I appreciate everything and uh, the team does also. Thank you very much. Our last uh, Hall of Fame recipient isn't a student at J. Sarah. He wasn't a coach at J. Sarah. He was one of our founders, Mark Spaziri. Mark Spaziri was a visionary for J. Sarah in more ways than just one. The idea of J. Sarah rests really with him, Tim Bush, and Tom Parr. Those three founders put in the time, energy, and their own financial backing to bring J. Sarah to fruition. Mark also had the foresight to realize that a world-class athletic program centered around mission-centric athletics would do much to build support for the school among prospective families. Mark realized that great coaches and excellent, excellent college-like facilities would work well to supplement a North Campus that had strong academics and a commitment to Catholic values. That Mark was so keen on athletic development, but never at the cost of compromising our school's focus on faith and academics set a tone that remains to this day. Mark's two children, Joe and Jenna, exemplified this at the school. They were good athletes, but more importantly, great people who worked hard in the classroom and who exhibited character and how they treated their teachers and their classmates. Beyond vision, Mark served in several practical capacities for the school. His contacts in the world of athletics helped us to find alternative training sites before the South Campus was built. He was essentially our first athletic director, though unpaid, when he hired coaches and trainers and helped create policies for the new department. He was also a tremendous financial backer for the program in general. And many of the teams were sponsored by Mark's businesses in our early years. In fact, many of those businesses used Mark's facilities for practices as Danny and Joseph alluded to earlier. As someone who helped coach girls basketball, I spent two years driving to one of his auto dealerships that happened to have a gym, which is where we were able to have practices. Mark put coaches in touch with pro athletes who helped programs in various ways. He held fundraisers at his businesses for the school's athletic programs that raised money and built camaraderie among teams. And I vividly remember many poker parties at his classic car dealership. Mark was connected with many people who aided Jay Sarah's early years. His business and athletic contra uh, contracts, contacts directly supported our athletic program, but he was equally valuable in connections with the city of San Juan Capistrano. The city and the history of the town were very important to Mark, and he made sure that they were looked at, that we looked at relations with the city as a partnership. He realized early on that the relationship between Jay Sarah and the city could be a mutually beneficial one, and history has indicated how correct that was. Mark was central. He was a central part of the governance at Jay Sarah. He was a board member and later a trustee. He served on virtually every committee at the school. He played a central role in virtually every major decision the school made in our early years. 
I personally have always appreciated Mark's uh, concern for the position of the staff and faculty at JSERA, and he always made sure that those, rep that those decisions that the board made kept in mind the voice of the faculty. Our beautiful South Campus also bears Mark's imprimatur in, in the terms of design and style. The Italian looking architecture was heavily influenced by Mark's ideas, and I've yet to meet anyone who hasn't found our campus to be exceptionally beautiful. I'm gonna now call up Mark, or excuse me, uh, Brett, to have some also some words about Mark. So when I was hired on August 14th, 2006, I walked on the baseball field and I was starting to clean it up. And these two gentlemen walked on the field and I asked them, hey, can I help you guys? And one of those gentlemen was Mark Spazier and he told me he was the founder and I immediately was like, okay, I'm gonna get fired in, the, in my first day on the job. And Mark um, took me to the gym and, and basically talked to me about his vision for the next, you know, three to five to seven to 10 to 20 to 40 years of what Jay Sarah could be. And I remember listening to him for, for those two to three hours and being like, I'm in, I want, I want this, you know, but it, what was most important to me was, was his care about our student athletes and his care about our school. And that we as coaches and administrators uphold that vision and be able to create what we think and what we thought at that time of what, it, what is Jay Sarah today. And I think it's, it's great student athletes, it's great leadership, it's great um, faculty, it's great students, it's great everything. It's, it's a phenomenal place to be. And I, and I really feel at that, those early stages in time with the Danny DeCorpos and the Capalettis and all the people and student athletes that were part of the school in the early years kind of saw what Mark's vision is. And for me, it was about appreciation to have someone that had that vision about what our school could be and what we wanted it to be. And we still talk about those conversations today and the times that we had trying to grow uh, this school, both ath athletically and academically. And for me, as Mark is a friend of mine and someone that I looked up to, or look, excuse me, look up to, to wanting to uphold what the J. Sarah mission is, and that's to be great in really everything that we do. Um, so for me, it's about storytelling about the person of who Mark is and what his vision is for J. Sarah. And I think the recognition of what we have today and the students and everybody that we are honoring today is really a part of his mission as well. So thank you. Mark, uh, Mark couldn't be here tonight, but he asked that I pass along his following comments. Regrettably, a family illness has pulled me out of town and prevented me from attending this inaugural event. I hope this event is the beginning of a new tradition and I look forward to attending it in the years to come. Thank you very much for this honor. I am both humbled and proud to be, to receive this recognition. Thanks to Chris and the athletic department, the Just Peace Committee, J. Sarah's current board and administration, and a very special thanks to those families, teachers, and administrators that took that leap of faith years ago when J. Sarah was just beginning. I had the honor and pleasure of working with some exceptional people back then. Our success in overcoming some formidable obstacles was remarkable. That success was achieved through the efforts of many people. If you will indulge me for a moment, I'd like to recognize some of those who without their passion and inspiration, J. Sarah would not have had the opportunity to become what it is. Names that are part of our heritage should not be forgotten. My fellow trustees, Frank Darris, Roberto Brudico, Tim Bush, and Tom Parr. The original faculty and staff, including Tom Wazak, Eric Stroop, Andy Sulik, Don Dickerson, Carlos Garcia, Nancy Melbourne, Chris Playa, Tom Smith, Jeff Cal, Teresa Houston, Lainey Peacock, and Don Boucher. Members of the community like Monsignor Martin, Mayor John Gelf, Tony Lapold, and the AD of Saddleback College, and David Ballardis, the chief of the Hachaman tribe. The list goes on and on. I apologize to anyone I may have left off. This beautiful facility was just a dream back then. It took leadership from some extraordinary student athletes like Joe and Danny that are deserving, deservingly being recognized tonight. It was their willingness to make sacrifices and exchange the safe, path, the safe path for a riskier one that led to the opportunity to create something special. They were the first and they built a foundation that created the culture that enabled J. Sarah to become what it is today. They endured practices in the parking lot 
two hour van rides to distant games that Danny alluded to, passing protesters on their way onto campus, going door to door gathering signatures to build community support for the school, attending and speaking at city council meetings and other atypical experiences for the average high school student. For J. Sarah to flourish, it required that inspiring group of student athletes and their supportive families. They built something exceptional and created the miracle that has become J. Sarah. They will always have the honor of being first. I also want to thank my wife, Candace, and my children, Joseph and Jenna, who took that leap of faith. My son, Joe, will always have the distinction of being J. Sarah's first varsity quarterback. I think he also hit uh, the first home run. So on behalf of Mark, I'll accept this award for him today. This closes the book on the ceremony tonight as it relates to the Hall of Fame. And I think we're going to bring Steve back up here tonight. Thank you. All right, let's hear it again for the inaugural Hall of Fame class for J. Sarah Catholic High School. A lot of great messages out there for you student athletes that are still here. Uh, just go through real quick with Danielle DeCorpo. Imagine being here at J. Sarah, no sports facilities. Imagine going through four years, how tough that had to be. When you think you had it tough, when you think you've got it tough, imagine what they had to go through, those early students, those first classes. Then you talk about Austin Hedges, talk about the importance of education, uh, how important it is if you, if you don't focus on the schoolwork, you, you, you're not going to get a chance to show what you can do in the sports. It all starts with schoolwork. Joseph Capaletti, whose dad, by the way, John, was an idol of mine growing up, Heisman Trophy winner. Let's give it up for John Capaletti, who's here as well. Great to see him tonight. But Joey, all of his classmates quitting, but him having the determination to stick at J. Sarah and fight through it because it meant something to him. And then Dante Pettis, again, you know, talked about if you're afraid to try something new because you're afraid of failing, you probably should be trying it. Don't be afraid to put your neck out and try something new. Also, keep God first. Great messages. We could go on and on. But those guys, all those people, guys and girls, champions, they deserve to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Let's give them one more round of applause. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, who really needs no introduction, but please draw your attention to the video screens to meet tonight's keynote speaker. Olympic indoor swimming pool was a stage for stars at the 1988 Summer Olympics. For the first time since 1976, the world's best would meet. Twelve years ago in Montreal, American men won 12 of 13 golds, while the East German women took 11 of 13 events. In Seoul, the U.S. and East Germans were still the leaders, but swimmers from around the world would challenge the two swimming powers. The stage was shared by many, but the spotlight belonged to three. All eyes upon Janet Evans, her first race the 400 meter individual medley the fastest qualifier in lane four counting down from the top of your screen and kathleen norton lane five the field rounded out by clatworthy dendova and lynn lee boy that looked like somebody was rolling a bit up in lane two but it's a good start and janet evans swimming three down from the top swimming just off the lead that is now held by the 16 year old from east germany daniela unger at the top of your screen in the white cap this is the event Tracy Calkins won by 10 seconds in Los Angeles. Because there's four different strokes, the lead could change according to the different swimmers' strengths. Donna DeVerona won this in Tokyo. The butterfly is the first 100 meters, two lengths of that stroke. Then they go to the backstroke, to the breaststroke, and to the freestyle. It should be pointed out that Janet Evans, who's swimming third down lane three, is best at the final two strokes. Pegging it to the final turn at a 6'17 year old Janet Evans, 101 pounds, who's got to stoke herself with food all day to keep that body weight up to 101. Evans with a substantial lead, and now they come to the final 50 meters. The moment of truth for little Janet Evans. Could she do it? She's Could got she it. Janet Evans fighting to hold on. She now has 20 meters to swim. And now they're coming to the wall, and Janet Evans getting close. She's going to win gold. Janet Evans of the USA wins gold in the 400-meter individual medley. 
800 meters. Second start after a false start is a good one. 16 lengths of the pool. The third place finish swimmer right now, Aka Morning, although Julie McDonald, an 18 year old from Australia, is starting to come on somewhat. Swimming in lane three. No question, this is the bell lap, meaning two lengths remaining. And the crowd from Australia is beginning to acknowledge that there's a race for silver medal. And now Janet Evans, those little arms, those small legs kicking, powering out. Strauss is coming on, though. Ten meters to swim. They'll not catch her. Janet Evans going for the gold. Three for three as Janet Evans comes to the wall and wins the gold medal. Back in the pool. Now we come to the final hundred meters, and they are faster than a world record split. The world record holder, Janet Evans, in the dark cap with the American flag, swimming just a bit above. Heike Friedrich of East Germany. Maybe a quarter body length lead. Now she extends a little more. They're coming up with 60 meters to swim. In 10 meters, they go to the turn. And the final 50 meters. And here comes Janet Evans to the wall to make the turn for home, going for her second Olympic gold medal. What guts, Don? What guts? A battle all the way, and it turns out as the coaches thought it would. Evans against Friedrich. Janet Evans, catch her if you can. And in hot pursuit is Heike Friedrich. But now as the race wears on, Janet Evans is putting away the East Germans. They can't stay with her. Janet Evans has put away Anka Mooring in lane five. And fading fast in lane two is Heike Friedrich. Evans is going to go wire to wire. Janet Evans has put away the East German threat. And Janet Evans goes to the wall with a world record time. She smashed a world record and wins Olympic gold for the second time here in Seoul. The manner in which she dominated East Germany's Heike Friedrich and the rest of the field seemed to surprise even the 17-year-old high school senior from Placentia, California, Janet Evans, living proof that sometimes the biggest of surprises come in small packages. Gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Miss Janet Evans Wilson. <laughs> oh, wait, no, not yet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So thank you for that. I am humbled. And um, I think one thing that Steve was going to mention but didn't is that I am a J. Sarah parent. I am a new J. Sarah parent. Um, so this is pretty impressive. Um, this is really impressive. So I'd actually like to thank my rising freshman daughter for choosing J. Sarah um, because I am very excited to be a J. Sarah parent for at least four years now. Um, so thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Unfortunately, I am way too old to have ever uh, competed for J. Sarah or swum for J. Sarah, but um, it feels like home. So thank you very much. Um, I would be remiss without starting the evening congratulating all of the athletes in the audience, um, all of the retired athletes, all of the current athletes, and all of the athletes um, that will come back to J. Sarah next year to compete for this amazing place. Um, so this evening, I speak to you. I speak to the parents, and I speak to the uh, administration, the athlete department, but I mostly speak to you because being a parent that was once an athlete, I understand your journey and I understand where life is going to take you, and I understand the importance that athletics plays in not only your high school experience, but the journey you take after high school and the journey you take well into adulthood. 
Um, from that video you just saw, which I couldn't really tell, but it's usually pretty grainy, so because um, it's really old, uh, so I, it's off of VHS. So I, I apologize for that, and maybe the team here at J. Sarah did a great job digitizing it or something. Because, um, but my journey began in high school, so I experienced a lot of what you experience now. I just went to the Olympics after my after my junior year of high school, but my journey really took me a long way after my high school experience. And what I learned in high school as a high school athlete really helped. So I'm gonna talk about my journey tonight and I hope it can relate to yours. I grew up here in Southern California, North Orange County. I learned how to swim because my mom doesn't know how to swim, uh, still doesn't know how to swim, won't put her head underneath the water and she didn't want my two older brothers and I uh, not to know how to swim. Was I a good swimmer when I was young? Yeah. I was a good swimmer. Was I a great swimmer? Was I a protege that people looked at me and said, she's going to be amazing? No. If you noticed in that video, all they say is, she's little, she's tiny, she has to eat food, like she's tiny. Her stroke is really funny, right? So imagine that when I was like seven, eight, nine, ten years old, right? I'd go to meets, I'd win a race, and people would say, oh, well, she won, but her stroke looks really funny. Or oh, but she won, but she's really tiny. She can't, she can't do anything. She's so tiny and her stroke is so funny. So when I look back on my young swimming days here in Orange County, I think I had a chip on my shoulder because I always thought, well, I might be tiny, but I'm mighty <laughs> and I can do this and I don't care how tiny all of you think that I am. In 1984, aging myself here, uh, the Olympics came to Los Angeles. I was 12. Uh, my parents took my older brothers and I to the Coliseum, and I sat in that opening ceremony, and I watched the incredible uh, American decathlete Rafer Johnson. For all you parents out there that might remember, I watched Rafer Johnson light the Olympic cauldron. And I know it was moving for all of us, but for me, it defined who I was as a young person. You know, the Olympics were boycotted in 1980. I was too young to remember the 76 Olympics. So the 84 Olympics here in Los Angeles were embedded in my, in my who I was. I wanted to be an Olympian. I wanted to march into opening ceremonies wearing our country's uniform um, behind our country's flag. I wanted to represent our country at the Olympic Games in the highest honor of sport. I remember after the Olympics, I went back to my coach. I was still a very good swimmer here in Orange County. And I said to him, I want to go to the Olympics. I am going to be at the next Olympic Games. And he said to me, yes, you are kind of tiny, <laughs> but I think you can do it. But I need to remind you on a frequent basis about instant gratification versus future rewards. I think especially as someone that was about to go into high school who wanted to be an elite athlete, instant gratification and future rewards are a very tangible thing that you have to accept. Instant gratification to me, when I started my freshman year at high school, would have meant turning the alarm clock off when it went off at 4.05 in the morning because for you, Aquatics people out there, as you know, we swim. We're a little crazy. We swim at 445. So instant gratification for me before morning workout would have been to turn off the alarm clock, rolled back over, and gone to bed. I'd just gotten up and gone to school like every normal person seems to do. But every morning when that alarm clock went off and my dad was in my bedroom shaking me or like flashing the lights to make sure that I would wake up, my first thought was, gosh, I can't wait to go back to sleep. And my second thought was, gosh, I can't wait to march in opening ceremonies at the Olympic Games. The second thought was always the thought that got me out of bed, got me in a cold swimming pool, and had me swimming six miles before I went to school. And that thought also had me swimming another six miles after school. In the four years from watching the 84 Olympics to competing in the 1988 Olympics, I never missed a practice. If my mom was here, my dad was still with us, he would say, they would say to you, before she got her driver's license, Janet would have walked <laughs> to practice. Did I love practice? No. 
I think any athlete sitting out there who says to you they love practice is not telling you the truth. There's a great athlete once, his name is Muhammad Ali, and he said, I hate practice, but I live every day going to practice so one day I can become a champion. To me, practice was doing my homework. Practice to me was understanding what I needed to do as an athlete. So when it came time for me to compete, I could execute like I knew I could. In the summer of 1987, after my sophomore year of high school, I was about, I don't know, 85 pounds. I was probably 5'3". I broke a world record or two. And I remember when I broke those world records, people said to me, that's amazing. You're really good, but you're really small. You're amazing, you're really good, but yeah, the Olympics are next year and you've never really swum against the Europeans. It's gonna be pretty tough. And my response was, well, I guess we'll see. My goal is to be an Olympian. My goal not necessarily was to win gold medals at my first Olympics, because I had people telling me I was too small, my stroke was too funny. And remember, all I really wanted to do was go to opening ceremonies and march in behind my country's flag and get all the really cool swag that you get, right? Because everyone was telling me I couldn't win at the Olympic Games. In the summer of 1988, I made my first Olympic team. Our Olympic trials were in Austin, Texas, and the Olympic Games were in Seoul, South Korea. We had six weeks between the Olympic trials and the Olympic Games. When you become an Olympian, which was my dream, it's really cool. Like, it's really cool. You get two suitcases full of new clothes and all of the new clothes have those incredible Olympic rings on them and Team USA. And I thought, wow, remember I was in high school. This is amazing. This is what it means to be an Olympian. I have Olympic t-shirts for the rest of my life. I can wear Olympic rings, right? On my uh, 17th birthday, the Olympic team flew from Austin, Texas. We flew here to Orange County, and we went to Disneyland on my 17th birthday, a place I'd been millions of times. But on my birthday, we had to parade down Main Street for the Olympic team, and we got to cut in line for any ride, because when you're an Olympian and you're wearing an Olympic shirt, you get to cut in line. After we went to Disneyland, we flew to Hawaii for three weeks without my parents and without my coach. And I was having a great time. I was body surfing, I was drinking chocolate milkshakes, because you know what? My goal of making it to the Olympics had come true. I was an Olympian and no one thought I could win. I was too little and my arms were really funny when I swam, so why would I bother winning? I was just happy to be an Olympian. I was showing up to practice but I maybe wasn't trying quite as hard as I could have at practice. And one day a man walked up to me. The parents will know who he is. The athletes, I'm not so sure. He walked up to me and he said, hey, um, he looks familiar, I didn't know him. He said, hey, hey, Janet, didn't introduce himself. Hey, uh, what's it like to be an Olympian? And I said, oh my gosh, you have no idea what it's like to be an Olympian. I have this cool swag. I got to go to Disneyland. I'm here in Hawaii without my mom and dad. No one can tell me what to do. And for the rest of my life, I told this man, for the rest of my life, I'll be an Olympian. It's pretty cool. And he goes, yeah, I know I'm an Olympian. And I said, oh my gosh, like we're like friends, right? Like we're automatic friends because you're an Olympian, I'm Olympian, this is great. Were you a swimmer? And he said, yeah, yeah, I was a swimmer. And I said, oh, when did you swim? He said, I swam in 1968. I said, okay, great. How did you do in 1968? And he said, oh, I won two golds and a silver and a bronze. I just did okay. Now here I am just wanting to march in opening ceremonies and I have a guy telling me winning four medals at the 68 Olympics was just okay. And I said, so what's just okay about four Olympic medals and one Olympic games? And he said, oh, none of the golds were individual medals. So I wanted to go back and I wanted to swim in 1972, and I wanted to win an individual gold medal. And I said, well, did you swim in 72? And he said, I did, I did. I said, well, how did you do? And he said, yeah, I, uh, I swam seven events. I won seven gold medals. I broke seven world records. It's really great to meet you because my name is Mark Spitz. So I had just told Mark Spitz, for all the young people, he's the Michael Phelps of my generation, that being an Olympian was really cool because he was gonna he was gonna be my friend forever. So that's my uh, that was my wake up call for how cool it is to be an Olympian. But Mark Spitz had a message for me. 
And Mark Spitz's message was this. It's really great to be an Olympian, but it's greater to be an Olympic champion. And I said, yeah, Mark, I get that. I hear that, but no one thinks I can win. And he said, well, I think, I think you can win. And I said, I know, but I'm small. And he said, I think you can win. And he said, you know, Janet, in life, when you reach a goal, you got to reset your goals. And sometimes you got to reset those goals quicker than you, you think you want to. I know you want to sit here and you want to enjoy what it's like to be an Olympian. You want to have a great time here in Hawaii, but you might only have one chance to go to the Olympics. Make it worth it and believe in yourself because I believe in you. That's kind of all I needed. I think in life, in sport, to be successful, we all need a champion. We need someone that can tell us things that we might not be ready to accept or might not be ready to shoot or aim for. Mark Spitz was that to me. The Olympic team left Hawaii and we went to Seoul, South Korea, where we moved into the Olympic Village. I was feeling pretty good about myself. My weight had gone up. I was about 99 pounds. I'd grown like an inch. So I was about 5'4". And we got to the swimming pool, my first major international competition ever. The swimming pool was, you know, pretty long, maybe longer than the width of this football field. And we got to the first day of practice. I was standing there feeling really great about myself. Mark Spitz believed in me. I thought I could win one medal. I had three chances. And a woman walked up behind me. She was about six feet tall. She was about 180 pounds, solid muscle. I watched her jump in the pool and I inherently counted her strokes. She took 24 strokes to get to the end of the pool. I take 42. <laughs> I looked back at one of my coaches, Coach Schubert, I don't think it was you. I looked back at one of the coaches and I said, who is that? And they said, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's an East German. A little history on the East German women, the 19, uh, 1972 uh, Olympics, they won no Olympic medals. In 1973, the East German government decided their athletes were gonna show the dominance of their state by uh, excelling at sport through other means. And at the 1976 Olympics in Montreal, the, uh, the, U the East German women won 11 of 13 gold medals. The Soviets, same program, won 12, the 12th medal and the US squeaked by with one gold medal in a relay. We boycotted 1980, they boycotted 1984. This was our first Olympics where the Western world would be competing against the East Germans since 1976. They held almost every world record on the books. They were uh, bigger than life in many more ways than you can say. And as I watched this woman swim up and down the pools like a cruise ship, it just jumped in the Olympic pool and I was gonna be a little wind-up toy that was supposed to go catch her. I stepped back and I thought to myself, well, to heck with Mark Spitz. I have t-shirts, I got a trip to Disneyland. <laughs> I will be friends with Olympians for the rest of my life because there is no way I'm gonna beat these women. They were intimidating. But when I stood on the blocks for all three of my races, it didn't matter to me because my mind allowed me to think that I could win. I might've been the smallest person there I probably wasn't the most talented swimmer there, although I, I was a good swimmer, but I was a swimmer there that believed in myself the most. And I was a swimmer there that had done my homework, practice every single day. When you stand at the starting line or at the start of a football game or on the base when you're playing your baseball game, you've done your homework. Now is the time to execute. If you've done it, this is your moment. Those were my moments in South Korea at the Olympics. It didn't matter that those girls were bigger than me. It didn't matter that my stroke was funny. It didn't matter that I was literally a foot shorter than them and 100 pounds lighter. What mattered is that I put my mind to what I was gonna do. I put in the work, I believed in myself, and that's what got me to the wall first. When I left those Olympics, I came home I was a senior in high school. I wanted to live. I was happy. I was an Olympian, I had gold medals, but something happened in that switch after coming home from the Olympics. I took a scholarship to swim in Northern California at Stanford and swimming became a chore. Swimming became something I didn't like. Swimming became pressure filled. Every time I jumped into the swimming pool, 
I was Janet Evans. I was that little girl with a big smile and the funny stroke that dominated. And every time I jumped into the pool and didn't break a world record or break an American record, people would say not nice things. The Stanford Daily, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Orange County Register, oh, Janet, she won, but she didn't break a world record. Oh, Janet, eh, she's getting old. Oh, Janet, this, Janet, that. And swimming became something I didn't like. I became a bad teammate. I started missing practices. <laughs> I started complaining when I was at practice. I wasn't a positive influence. You would think an Olympic champion would be a positive influence on any team. I was actually a negative influence. And in the middle of my sophomore year, I called up my parents who are now empty nesters and I said to them, I'm quitting swimming. We're 18 months outside of the Barcelona 1992 Olympics. I'm gonna quit, I'm gonna move home. So deal with it. <laughs> and my parents who never told me what to do with my swimming, this one time said to me, don't quit. Don't do this, find a place that you can find some happiness with your swimming. You got 18 months to go. We know you can do it. I call up a man who just happened to be in the audience here tonight. His name is Mark Schubert, the current coach at the Mission Viejo Natadors. <laughs> Where we actually, I will say coach, the Natadors have a lot of up and coming swimmers. So like this is a, you know, we're a, we're a good place over here at J. Sarah to have a good, good swimmers here. Um, I called up Mark and I said, I'm, I'm unhappy. Make it fun for me again. Make it fun. He was coaching at the University of Texas. Mark tried, you can ask him. We tried to make it fun, but for me, the joy was gone and the pressure of living up to always having to win when I jump in the swimming pool was almost too much for me to handle. I trained with Mark in Texas for 18 months. I made my second Olympic team and we did all the great things. We got all the clothes. We went to the South of France for three weeks, but I didn't enjoy it. I didn't have fun, I didn't like it. I saw the Barcelona Olympics as a means to an end because I just wanted to win my medals, prove to the world I was still a good person because my name was Janet Evans and I could swim fast and I wanted to go home. My first race in Barcelona was the 400 freestyle, my favorite race. Um, and Mark Schubert walked up to be before my race and he said, there's a girl that swims next to you. She's a former East German, she's big, she's strong. And uh, she has a very fast last 50 meters. You've never raced her, be careful, she could pass you. What I said to my coach was, I haven't lost this race in seven years. I'm the world record holder and the defending Olympic champion and no one can beat me. You are never too good to learn from other people. You are never too good not to listen to your coach. You are never too good to think that you don't have to listen to anyone. Mark Schubert was right. She passed me in the last three meters and I was touched out for the gold medal by 19 one hundredths of a second. I received my silver medal. I went into the media room and the first question was, what happened? Which is a very typical of all of the sports reporters, what happened? The second question was, how does it feel to lose? How does it feel to lose, all right? Here I am, I'm 20 years old. My entire identity is wrapped around winning and I am being told that I just lost. I was crushed. I cried a lot. I picked myself up. I swam the 800 meter freestyle four days later. I won the gold medal, but I didn't win it for myself. I didn't win it for our country. I won it to prove to everyone that I was still a great person because I could still swim really fast. It was actually a very hollow victory. And I think, uh, I think now I appreciate my silver medal more than anything because I've, I've had to learn with that silver medal. I left the Barcelona Olympics with what any athlete would dream of, a gold medal and a silver medal in two individual events, but I was done. I wanted nothing to do with the sport of swimming anymore. I moved home again, <laughs> my parents weren't happy, and I re-enrolled up at Stanford. I wasn't gonna swim, I was gonna be a normal student. I was gonna join a sorority. Um, I was gonna go to law school. Those were my dreams. I was 21 years old and my life was just beginning. And then one day, Mark Schubert called me and he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh my gosh, life without swimming is amazing. You have no idea. I don't smell like chlorine every day. My hair is getting long. I swear my shoulders are like shrinking coach. Like this is life without swimming is amazing. And he said, yeah, 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 whatever. I'm just calling to tell you that I'm leaving the University of Texas and I'm gonna be the head coach at Southern Cal at USC. 
And I said, that's great, coach. That's fantastic. I will come visit you as I'm driving back up to Stanford where I am going to stay up past 10 o'clock and my shoulder is going to continue shrinking and my hair is going to continue to grow long and I'm not going to smell like chlorine. And he said, actually, I'm calling because I, I think you need to swim again. And I said, I, I, don't, I don't want to swim again. I just told you, coach, I'm, uh, I'm going to join a sorority. And he said, no, 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 you need to swim again. And I said, why? And he said, because you have a lot to learn. I said, what do I have to learn? He said, well, you have to learn how to be a champion. You're not a champion. I said, I'm, I, I'm a champion. I'm a, I don't know, it was up there on the screen. I, I don't, I'm too old to remember. I don't know, it was four time Olympic champion, national champ. I'm a champion coach. I'm a champion. He said, no, uh, -uh you're, you're a winner. You're a winner. But my fear is that once swimming is over, microcosm of real life, you're not gonna understand how to be a champion. You're not gonna understand that you're gonna lose. <laughs> you're not gonna understand that life's gonna throw you speed bumps and you're not gonna understand how to be a good teammate or a good loser or even a good winner. You need to come back, you need to swim for four more years and you actually need to learn how to be a champion. Well, I didn't wanna do it. Who would really wanna swim 10 miles a day for four more years when life is like calling, right? But his point was valid. I inherently knew that the way I had left swimming after the Barcelona Olympics wasn't the way I wanted to leave a sport that had brought so much in my life. And I also inherently knew that I needed to become a person outside of swimming. My whole identity was wrapped up with my sport and my sport wasn't going to be my whole identity for the rest of my life. So I enrolled at USC and we made it my goal to learn how to lose. We made it my goal to have a life outside of the swimming pool. And we made it my goal to not be Janet Evans, the swimmer. Every day when I left the pool deck and I closed the gate, life continued for me. I wasn't Janet the swimmer. I didn't take my workout home. I didn't think about it. I became a student. I became a friend. I kind of met my husband, but he was a fraternity boy, so I couldn't associate with people like him because I was too busy swimming 12 hours, miles a day, but I eventually, eventually made my way. But I became a real person swimming at USC, and I lost more races in those four years than I ever had in my entire life. But I also realized as my dad used to say to me, if you don't touch the wall first, the sun's still gonna come up tomorrow morning and your parents are still gonna love you and it doesn't change who you are. I graduated from college, I met people. I was Janet Evans, a student, a friend, a daughter and a swimmer. And in the summer of 1996, my journey took me to my third Olympic team. My goal was to go to the Olympics and swim as fast as I could. Not necessarily win, but in our six week training camp in Knoxville, Tennessee, it wasn't the South of France and it wasn't Hawaii. I started reading the newspapers and the newspapers said, well, if Janet wins more gold medals, she'll have this many medals, Janet this, Janet that, this is what the medals from Atlanta look like. And I started thinking, gosh, I wanna go to the Olympics and I wanna win. I wanna win because I am Janet Evans and I can be a champion at everything else, but when it comes to the Olympics, I really need to win because I still hadn't reached that threshold where my identity wasn't wrapped around Janet Evans, Olympic champion. So here I am sitting in Tennessee, waiting to drive to Atlanta and a gentleman calls me and his name is Billy Payne. Some of you might recognize Billy Payne. He's the former chairman of Augusta, but before he went to Augusta, he was the chairman of the 1996 Atlanta Olympic Games. And Billy had become a friend of mine through the years. And Billy called me up and he said, hey, Janet, uh, I need a favor of you. He's the boss at the Olympics. I need a favor of you. And I said, okay, what do you need? And he said, well, I need you to run the torch at opening ceremonies. I'm not gonna tell you who's passing you the torch. I'm not gonna tell you who you're passing the torch to, but you will be the second to last runner with the Olympic torch and the final woman to carry the Olympic torch. And I said, yeah, that's, that's a really nice gesture, Billy. I really appreciate it, but I don't go to opening ceremonies. And what I failed to mention was that Mark Spitz told me not to go to opening ceremonies because swimming starts the day after. And most swimmers don't go to opening ceremonies because we're home resting 
And my dream of going to open ceremonies wasn't compatible with my dream of becoming an Olympic champion. So I never got to go to opening ceremonies. So I never understood what it was like to march in behind my country's flag, to represent us at the opening ceremonies. So when Billy Payne asked me to run the torch, it didn't mean a lot to me. I was the athlete at the Olympics living in the village with 10,000 other athletes who only ate with Americans, preferably swimmers. Sometimes I branched out, but I didn't want to meet athletes from other countries. I was there to win. The Olympics was my place to win gold medals. I wasn't worried about meeting the basketball player from another country. I just wanted to win. And I didn't understand the meaning of the Olympics and the meaning of the torch. So when I was asked to carry the torch, I said no. And Billy Payne, he's a Southern man, and he was very convincing, and he kept asking me to do it. And finally, he asked me, why would I not do this? And I said, well, let me flip the question on you. Why should I do this? And he said, because if you run the torch at the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games, it will be the greatest moment of your Olympic career. And I very distinctly remember thinking, this man doesn't know what it's like to win a gold medal because clearly winning a gold medal is much, much better than running in a stadium with an Olympic torch. And I kind of said that to him and he said, no, no, you, you, you need to do this. And so I agreed half-heartedly and with trepidations, trepidation, I agreed to run the Olympic torch at the opening ceremonies. And on the day of opening ceremonies, I was picked up in the village under the cover of something because I wasn't allowed to tell anyone. And I was taken to the opening ceremonies where 10,000 athletes had already marched into the infield and someone was gonna be waiting for me at the top of the steps to light the Olympic cauldron. I literally get pushed out of the tunnel in Atlanta onto the opening ceremony field with an Olympic torch. And it's dark and there's athletes standing on the infield and Evander Holyfield starts running to me with the Olympic torch. And I think, hey, this is kind of cool. Like I get to meet Vander Holyfield. Like I don't really know what I'm doing and I have to run all this way, but this is gonna be cool. Vander Holyfield runs to me, passes me the Olympic flame. I don't really know what to do. I turn around and I start running. I'm worried about myself. I'm a swimmer. I'm gonna fall. I'm gonna light the stadium on fire. I'm gonna catch my hair on fire. I have no idea what I'm doing. I just know that even though I'm a terrible runner, I have to put one foot in front of the other and I have to make it up these three humongous ramps to get to the top, to get this whole thing over with because gosh darn it, I need to swim the next day and I'm gonna win my gold medal and I need to get off of this track to go home and win. And I start running the torch and I have all those thoughts through going through my mind. And then I look to my left and there's all of the athletes 10,000 of them. The Americans had pushed their way to the front. They were in the front. So there was like the, the volleyball team with the gymnast on their shoulders. <laughs> and there was the water polo team with their bleached hair. And they were saying something like, she's gonna fall because she's a swimmer and swimmers don't know how to run. And they were laughing at me. And I saw my people, the Americans. And as I ran with this torch, I noticed that all the athletes were moving with it. They weren't moving with me and they weren't looking at me because the torch was up here, but they were moving with this torch. And I thought, gosh, that's incredible. These athletes are, are drawn to this, to the torch, to these opening ceremonies. This is incredible. And I stopped thinking about falling or lighting my hair on fire. And I start thinking about all those athletes that were at the Olympic games. Do you know that 90% of the athletes who compete at the Olympic games do not win medals, no medals. They don't go home with gold or silver or bronze in their swim bags or their backpacks, 90% of them. So opening ceremonies, the tradition, the history, the meaning of competition, that's, that's their gold medal. And as I was running this torch, I realized that. I realized that the vast majority of athletes that compete at the Olympic games aren't there to win medals but they're there as a part of their journey. They're there because they got up every morning at 4 a.m. They're there because their dad shook them and woke them up and drove them to practice. They're there to represent their country and their families and their friends. And they're not worried about winning, they're worried about being a champion. I had this epiphany, I had this moment, and I somehow 
got to the top of that podium and who was standing there waiting for me, if any of you remember, but Muhammad Ali. And you talk about a champion and you talk about someone who was an absolute shadow at that moment of who he was in 1960 as Cassius Clay when he won his Olympic gold medal. And there was a brief moment when I was passing him the flame that I looked in his eye and it was incredible because he was looking at me and I was looking at him. The stadium was shaking. It felt like an earthquake. And he looked at me like, I'm gonna do this. Because at practice the night before, Muhammad Ali dropped the torch in practice 12 times out of 12 in practice. And that is what Billy Payne whispered in my ear right before I ran out. You need to help Muhammad Ali if he drops the torch. So when I looked at Muhammad Ali, my message to Muhammad Ali with my eyes was, get this done, you better get this done because I don't want to help you. And the moments that Muhammad Ali was lighting that cauldron and his hand was shaking, if any of you remember, it was shaking. It was the longest 10 seconds of my life. But once he lit that cauldron and it worked, and the look in his eye, and the moment for him, he was a champion. He wasn't gonna go out there and win a boxing gold medal, but he was saying to the world, it doesn't matter where you are in life. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if you're sick, you're a champion. And the inspiration he gave those people in that stadium that evening, including me, still sticks with me. Life isn't always good, life's hard, life's throw you curveballs. There were no curveballs for anyone in life in that stadium harder than Muhammad Ali that evening. He took a chance, he stood in front of the world and he lit that Olympic cauldron. I meet people all the time who say to me, oh my gosh, I remember you. You beat these Germans in 88 and you won a couple more gold medals in 92 and you pass the torch to Muhammad Ali in 1996. And I say to them, actually I swam in 1996. And they go, you did? And I said, I did. And they say, but did you win a medal? And I say, no, mm -mm. I didn't win any medals in 1996. I got ninth in my first race and I got sixth in my second race at the 1996 Olympics. I don't have a medal to show from the Olympic games in Atlanta. I was disappointed, I wanted to win. But there is one piece of memorabilia in my home down the street that's displayed. And it's not my Olympic medals, it's my Olympic torch. Because that was the evening and that was the Olympics where I learned what it means to be a champion. Being a champion is, is many, many things, right? For me, becoming a champion began in 1988 when I realized that the journey takes you to a point where you have to believe that you can do the impossible. 1988, as a junior in high school, taught me, you can be little, you can be small, people can tell you you can't do things, but put your mind to it and you can do it. 1992 taught me that you have to have perspective. Perspective is the most important thing that you can have in anything you do. It's a sport, it's a job, it's life. Perspective, it doesn't matter. Like my dad said, the sun's gonna come up the next morning. And in 1996, I learned that you have to have balance. Balance, because sometimes you're gonna win and sometimes you're gonna lose, but you have to be a whole person. You have to be a student, a parent, a daughter. You have to be all of those things. It doesn't matter. You have to have balance. So that was my journey to becoming a champion. That's what the Olympics taught me. So for all of you out there, for all of you athletes, you have incredible journeys coming your way and your journeys will continue. Your journeys aren't just for your athletic career, your journeys are for the rest of your life. So I encourage you to take what you're learning here at J. Sarah and take that journey and become an even greater champion than you already are. Thank you so much, God bless, and good luck to all of you. Thank you.
<laughs> how about that? I mean, how do you top that? Unbelievable. So for all you student athletes that are still hanging out there back there, uh, it was worth sticking around. And I think the one message that we all would have is you may not end up being an Olympic champion. You may not end up getting in, inducted into the J. Sarah Hall of Fame. Maybe you will. You should have those kind of goals, but everyone can be a champion. That, that's the term by how you live your life and how you go about treating other people and, and learning the lessons along the way. So we can all do that. So thank you, Janet, very, very much. We appreciate that perspective and that message. Okay, uh, we're gonna try something new, uh, not, not something new, it's the first, all this is the first time. So, uh, and thank goodness I, I, I forgot my sunblock today. And, and uh, fortunately now the sun is behind that mountain. I don't have to worry about it anymore, uh, but it's been a challenge. That's the only real challenge of the day was dealing with that sun in the face. Um, we have a cool feature we're gonna do right now uh, that just got added to the JESPE agenda last Monday. Um, and it's because of something that happened uh, to a few J. Sarah alums. Uh, the 11th seeded Santa Clara women's soccer team defeated the number one seeded Florida State soccer team in the Division I Women's Soccer Championship. After 110 minutes, after the regulation game at overtime, the score was still tied at one to one, and it took penalty kicks to crown Santa Clara, the Broncos from Santa Clara as national champions. And on that team were three J. Sarah alums who are now national champions. Rachel Bastone, class of 2020. Isabella De Aquila, De Aquila class of 2019, Julie Doyle, class of 2017, all were on that team and are all now national champions. And we're hoping that this alumni spotlight will continue to be a tradition we can emphasize and illustrate how many J. Sarah alums are accomplishing these things in years to come. Uh, we hope we have many more of these stories, but I would like to recognize without embarrassing Rachel, Rachel Bastone is here with us tonight. So if you can stand up and wave, Rachel, wherever you are, let us recognize you over here. You've made Lion Nation very proud. Congratulations. That's awesome. Okay, what is a JESPE? We're going to get right into it. What is a JESPE? Well, it's the brainchild of athletic director Chris Ledyard, who was looking to create an all-athletics all end-of-the-year banquet and was sharing his vision with someone we all know who've been here, Jay Sarah, for a while. We all know this gentleman, uh, Carlos Garcia, who ironically was the first athletic director here at Jay Sarah. He's now the facilities director. And he was explaining his vision to Carlos. And... Carlos came up with the idea and said, let's call it the J. Sarah's Jespies. We'll just call it the Jespies. And what that stands for is the J. Sarah Excellence in Sports Performance Yearly. And it was an incredible idea that kind of took on a life of its own. So the credit really goes not only to Chris Ledyard for, for buying into it, but give the credit to uh, Carlos Garcia as well. Car is, he, is Carlos here? He had to leave, unfortunately, but he's been an institution here around the school for many, many years, and what a great idea, a, a idea it was. And we're going to start it right now. It's, it's an accolade that is currently presented by Jay, Jay Sarah Athletics to recognize individual and team athletic achievements in a given year. Modeling the ESPYs, we have 10 awards that are tailored for our community and will be described as we honor all the recipients of today's awards. However, this is much more than just an award ceremony. It's an opportunity to celebrate our student athletes, coaches, parents, volunteers, teachers, staff members, and fans that have put so much of their time and energy into these programs in this incredibly challenging and difficult year. We're acknowledging them for their sacrifices in pursuit of competition and getting better every day. So with no further ado, we're gonna to get to the first award. 
The first award is the Breakthrough Athlete of the Year, presented by Farmers and Merchants Bank. This award is presented to the student athlete, irrespective of gender or sport, have judged to be the most, to have made the most significant or best breakthrough in his or her sport this year. In recent SP awards, this award has gone to the likes of Saquon Barkley or Jake Arietta, to name a few. The Jay Sarah the Jay Sarah student athlete receiving this award for the first time had a tremendous impact on his team. Standing at only five foot eleven as a basketball player, he's at a slight height disadvantage in a league where most of the competition is significantly taller. But this National Honor Society student who carries a 4.1 GPA wouldn't allow his size to keep him from scoring. He averaged 15 points a game for the boys basketball team and was leading Orange County in three pointers at the time of his nomination. His goal coming into high school was to get an opportunity to play division one basketball. And thanks to his breakthrough performance this year, that dream is going to happen. He will get that opportunity to play at Tulane University, where he's earned a preferred walk-on spot. Jay Sarah's inaugural Breakthrough Athlete of the Year, presented by Farmers and Merchants Bank, goes to Max Bowman. Max Bowman. <laughs> next award is going for the play of the year and is presented by the Patilli family. This award is presented to the single play or performance irrespective of sport contested or irrespective of gender. It's a judge to be the most remarkable, significant or impressive in a given year. The play of the year took place this year at St. Pierre Field during the first baseball game that had taken place in over a year. The team entered the season ranked number two in the country, but struggled out of the gate in their first game, trailing three to one in the fifth inning. Finding themselves in a tough situation, the Lions capitalized on back-to-back -back errors in the fifth inning to tie the game and pre-see pre the drama that was to later unfold. The game remained tied at four to four and went into extra innings. And in the bottom of the ninth, Cody Schreier led off the inning with a triple to left field, followed by back-to-back -back intentional walks to Gabe Darcy and Luke Jewett, setting up David Horn, who came up to the plate when he took advantage of the bases loaded opportunity to do what? He hit the walk-off grand slam home run to win the game right over here on this field, propelling the Lions to a great season with an 8-4 to four victory. This year's Play of the Year, presented by the Patilli family, goes to David Horn of the baseball team. <laughs> This is a special award coming up here 
uh, the Father Damien Impact Award presented by the, I hope I get this right, the, the Codger family. Is that right? Okay. We're going to change it up here for a second. I'm going to introduce Donna Finn for a... Don, Donna Vandenberg. I'm sorry. I didn't know anything about this, Donna. I'm sorry. Come on up. You're going to come up for... Hang on a minute. We're waiting for some music to cue up here. Sorry, guys. Hang on just a second. Eric, we good? From the Lego Batman movie. Okay. And when I tell you about this award, it'll make sense why I'm making references to the Lego Batman movie. The Impact Award is presented to a deserving member of the athletics community who has had the greatest impact on their team, sport, or program in a given year. But before we talk about this year's recipient, I want to talk to you a little bit about another individual who has had a tremendous impact on the JCR community. And he has had an impact here for the past 13 years. There are so many Father Damien stories that we could spend the rest of the evening talking about how he has impacted the JCR students, parents, faculty, and staff. No, he's not your average priest. His knowledge of sports is second only to his knowledge of the Catholic faith. His ability to weave sports and sports scores into his homilies is amazing. Now, I know his boss is here, Father Augustine. So, Father, you might want to plug your ears for the rest of this. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Father once or maybe two or three times or four times integrated his love of martial arts into a homily. I'm not really sure what the point was of the nunchucks. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It was awesome. What father does when he does these kinds of things is he makes himself and our faith very relatable. And this is such a beautiful thing that he does for our students. Um, and I, again, he makes a lot of references to the Batman movie and he integrates those into his homilies as well. And that's fabulous. Not sure the point always, but fabulous. After giving the prayer before each football game starts, Father Damien turns into a totally different human being. And his reputation at, the, at athletic events is legendary. Father Damien is the first guy to run a flag at a football game that's twice his size, screaming, go Jay Sarah, at the top of his lungs. He's the guy that crowd surfs at basketball games. And there have been a few near misses over the years as students carry Father over their heads from the top of the bleachers to the gym floor. I especially love, and I'm being super facetious now, um, when Father Damien decides he's gonna do a backflip into the stands on his back and expect everyone to catch him. And he does this expecting that the, the kids will catch him, and they always do. I remember a particular basketball game, and if you ask anybody, probably almost anybody, about their favorite Father Damien memory, 
It's at basketball games where um, Father Augustine, he may or may not have parted the student section, much like Moses did with the Red Sea. He ran through the crowd, the center, he ran through the center of the crowd, up the bleachers with his totally yard sale made up cross, ran to the top, turned around and fell back. And crowd surfed all the way down to the gym floor. Father Damien has made a huge impact on the JSR community, as I said, for the last 13 years in the classroom, during mass, on retreats, in campus ministry, and especially during snow day where he turns into a really different human being as the um, captain of one of the snowball team, or yeah, one of the snowball teams. Students who have long since graduated reach out to him for weddings and baptisms. And I can think of no other individual who has made the kind of impact that he has on the JSERA community. So going forward, the Just Be Impact Award will be named the Father Damien Impact Award. So Father, I'm happy to present this to you. Okay. Well, we apologize for that little mix-up. I didn't get that note that we were going to bring him up here beforehand, so that's on me for not being on top of that one. But obviously, very deserved for Father Damien. I've had four kids come through J. Sarah. My fourth is a freshman here right now, and most of them went to St. Anne's prior. So I've had many years of sitting through those homilies with Father Damien and, and uh, enjoying his antics. Uh, his reptile fetish, we'll just call it that, I guess. <laughs> but he, he we, he's brought about every animal, every kind of animal possible into that gymnasium at St. Anne's, and he's probably done it here at J. Sarah too, but uh, well-deserved. So we'll get right to the winner of the Father Damien Impact Award, presented by the Cadger family. The description is presented to a deserving member of the athletics community, who had the greatest impact on their team, sport or program in a given year. The winner of this award has been a great leader who often speaks with teammates about what it means to be a lion and why the highest level of commitment is necessary to participate within this program. Her normal position for the softball team is left field. In 2020, she was called upon to catch many games for the Lions. Just when she thought those days were over, the starting catcher suffered a concussion this season and was out for four games. On April 9th at South Torrance, this young lady caught her first game of the 2021 season. After a few innings, her hand hurt so bad from the impact of catching the pitches that she was in tears but it was not an option for her to quit because she refused to let her team down. After several innings, Coach Stife gave her a break and her first inning in center field, she was hit in the nose by a batted ball and that took a bad hop. Even though her nose was bleeding relentlessly, she wouldn't leave the game. She grabbed the towel, ran back out on the field and finished it out. This story is just the most memorable experience but consistent with the display of heart and dedication of this young lady, who is this year's Impact Award winner every single day she steps out on the field and as an example to her teammates. The Father Damien, the first annual Father Damien Impact Award presented by the Cadger family goes to Priscilla Gillies. 
softball team. Right from a game to picking up the SP. Jespy, excuse me. Sorry, Coke, Mr. Meyer. I apologize. The copyright issues there, I know. My bad. Okay. Uh, the next award is going to go for the game of the year. And this is sponsored by, presented by the Capital Group. This is presented to the single game, irrespective of sport, adjudged to be the best in a given year. In the 15 year existence, of the Trinity League, the J. Sarah boys golf team had yet to get a victory over their arch nemesis, the Servite Friars. Aside from myself, there's a couple more up here in the front that were Servite men and uh, that golf program has been a dynasty for many years. 15 years, the J. Sarah boys golf team had not beaten the Servite golf team. Not only had they not gotten a victory over the Friars, but in the early years, they would occasionally suffer losses by more than 100 strokes, if you can believe that. This story is amazing, though. But in recent years, they've gotten closer within one or two strokes on occasion. And this year, in the first meeting with them at Servite's home course, Western Hills Country Club, the course was playing tough on a cold day. In golf, you play seven players and they count the best five scores. As the scores were trickling in, it started to, became, started to become obvious that it was gonna be a very tight match. And like the boys might finally have their day. Once everything had finished, turning in scores, the match was tied. And in that situation, they go to the sixth golfer. Guess what, after the sixth golfer, it was still tied. In that situation, it goes to the seventh score to determine who wins. And at that point, it was determined that the Lions had finally had their breakthrough moment. They won by two shots over Servite. According to Coach Schipple, what made this victory against Servite so great was it took the entire team to beat them for the first time. It showed our guys that no matter how you're playing, where either the first, the, the leading score or the, or the lowest score that particular day, it doesn't matter. Everybody needs to play like it matters. You have to always continue to fight for your team because you never know when it's going to happen. It showed our guys that you can never give up on yourself or your team because your teammates are counting on you to finish the deal. You need to stay focused and give it everything you have until the very end. So in honor of that great victory over the Servite Friars, the game of the year is presented by the Capital Group, and it goes to the boys' golf team and head coach Brian Schipple. <laughs> to come I'm sure all right the next award goes to record-breaking or for the record-breaking performance and this is presented by the TPS family of companies this award is presented to the record or for the record-breaking single play single game or season performance 
irrespective of sport or gender of the participating student athlete. This record breaking performance took place at the Arcadia Invitational Track Meet where our girls distance medley relay team broke the previous school record by 36 seconds. If you can believe that. In the 1200, now the, 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 I learned this in reading about this award. There are different legs during the course of this event. The first leg is a 1200 meter leg and that was run by sophomore Anastasia Snodgrass. And she took the early lead running a 338 and on pace for a sub five minute mile. The next leg was the 400 meter leg, more of the sprint of this, of this event. And that was junior Hannah Barmettler. And she increased the lead running a personal best of 59 seconds. Then came the 800 meter leg where junior Ashley Gallegos maintained the lead running a two minute and 18 second leg and the final 1600 meters or mile was run by freshman Georgia Generet, who anchored the relay and which led to a national best time this year of, well actually led to the nation leading victory. She ran her one mile leg in four minutes and 54 seconds. Going into the race, the current national leader for the event was from Ann Arbor, Michigan with a time of 11 minutes, 59.79 seconds. The J. Sarah girls team took the national lead in the distance medley relay by over five seconds and the California lead by over 11 seconds. An incredible accomplishment by this group of young ladies. The record breaking performance presented by TPS family of companies goes to Anastasia Snodgrass, Hannah Barmettler, Ashley Gallegos, and Georgia Generic of the women's track and field distance medley relay team. And head coach Chase Frazier. That's an incredible accomplishment. All right, the next award. This goes for the team of the year and it's presented by Angels Baseball. And we thank them for their sponsorship. Presented to the team, irrespective of sport or gender, contested and adjudged to be the most outstanding in a given year. Currently ranked number two in Orange County and I hope, I don't know if that's still the case after uh, winning the Trinity League uh, just last night, I believe. Uh, this team boasts 13 Division I commits with our seniors headed to the following institutions to continue their athletic and academic careers. Arkansas, St. Thomas University, the University of Chicago, USC, Washington, Yale, and four players are going to UCLA. This team set many records this year with multiple no hitters and the longest program winning streak of 18 consecutive games. This year, the team of the year presented by Angels Baseball goes to, you got it, our boys baseball team and head coach Brett Kay.
a lot of work right there, but I shake a lot of hands. Okay, we're going to move on to the next one. Congratulations to the boys baseball team, who, by the way, we're expecting a CIF championship out of still to come. Right, guys? That's the goal right now. They got more work to do. Okay, the next award is the Perseverance Award presented by the Zyman family. The description of this award is presented to a deserving member of the athletics community who has overcome great obstacles through perseverance and determination. Coach K describes this young man as a gentle soul. In fact, okay. So this, uh, the, the, the boys may want to hear this, I guess. Uh, baseball players, listen up. Coach K describes this young man as a gentle soul who loves his family and will do great things and go to great lengths to protect his mother, his brother, and extended family to the ends of the earth with his constant love and affection. You put him on the field, he becomes a monster on the baseball field. He is a young man who continues to shed light as to what it means to be a J. Sarah Lion and to continue to shine bright while having suffered the loss of an important loved one at a young age. Our honoree has also been awarded the Junior Male Faculty Award winner for 2020, the Orange County Athletic Directors Association Character Award, and recently the Rotary of San Juan Capistrano Scholarship Award winner. And he's committed to the University of Arkansas where he'll play baseball. The Perseverance Award presented to the Zyman family or by, presented by the Zyman family, goes to Gabe Darcy from the baseball team. What a great story and what a great young man and well-deserving, obviously. Okay, the next award, the Courage Award presented by the Ristoff family. This award is presented to the student athlete or team, irrespective of gender, gender or sport contested, at judged to have made the most significant or compelling humanitarian contribution in transcendence of sports in a given year. The winner of this award showed tremendous courage and strength in his four years at J. Sarah. From the beginning, he was dealt a tough hand. Coming into the program, coming into a program that was in flux and in need of leadership and stability. He constantly worked to make others around him better. Asking questions, pushing others, and doing his best to set the tone and change the culture. By his sophomore year, many of his teammates had given up. But he pressed on, determined to do his best and succeed both on and off the field and in the classroom. By his junior year, he had established himself as a team leader and began to help the team shift the culture of the program. When the pandemic hit is when he really stepped up and showed the courage to keep going. He did not quit. He did not abandon his teammates. He stayed focused on the task at hand and did what he could to keep his teammates engaged in the program, also striving to keep the program thriving remotely. He also didn't let the last year affect his ambitions to play in college. As a result of his courage, he will be attending Calvin University and continuing to play lacrosse there. Coach Adam Guy said this, this is an immense accomplishment considering where he started and what he was up against. It took courage, heart, grit, and determination to get to where he is now. This young man left the program and the school better than when it was when he arrived. The Courage Award presented by the Ristoff family goes to Jacob Bledsoe, boys lacrosse.
That's great. Okay, the next award. There's two left. We've got first up the Male Athlete of the Year, presented by Reyes Coca-Cola. This award goes to the athlete. Well, the, I should say the Athlete of the Year awards are awarded to the boy and girl who at J. Sarah have demonstrated excellence in their sport in that particular school year. To be eligible for this award, a student must have competed in a J. Sarah varsity sport and brought a level of excellence to their sport. According to Coach K, simply put, this is the best pitcher in the history of J. Sarah Catholic High School. This school has seen some great sports performers, and this athlete ranks among the very best of them. He epitomizes competitor and brings his energy and electricity to every opportunity he gets, whether on the mound or the plate or at the plate. I would match him up against any high school pitcher in the country. Here are his current stats. Seven wins, zero losses. In 44.2 innings, he's given up only 18 hits. One earned run all season. 83 strikeouts in 44.2 innings and a .15 earned run average. Those of you that know baseball know that is absolutely impossible to do. .15. So far in this telling season for Jay Sarah baseball, he also doubles as an offensive threat. He's batting close to 300 with a 441 on base percentage, four doubles, two triples, two home runs, 16 RBIs, 19 runs and 18 walks. I think the list could go on and on. This guy is something special. The male athlete of the war of the year award goes to, well, actually presented by Reyes Coca-Cola, goes to Gage Jump from the baseball team. <laughs> And the final award of the night goes to the Female Athlete of the Year, presented by H.C. Associates. I hope I read that right. H.C. Associates, yes. Oh, J. what is it? JLC, there you go. See the lighting here, I tell you. The sun goes down, I have trouble. My, uh, my 56-year-old eyes. JLC, there we go, that's right. Just seeing if you are paying attention, that's all. Good job. Thank you. All right, the Female Athlete of the Year. We already talked about what it was for the, for the, for the boys. Uh, it's a JSER athlete who has demonstrated excellence in their sport in that particular school year. To be eligible for this award, the student must have competed in a JSER varsity sport and brought a level of excellence to that sport. This junior softball player started in every game at third base this season. The number three batter and the leader of this young Jay Sarah softball team. She has a 452 batting average, a 528 on base percentage, a 742 slugging percentage, a 95 or 0.959 fielding percentage, 74 chances, 30 putouts, four double plays, her notable performances. She went four for four against Rosary, driving in two runs to secure a seven to three victory. She also went three for four in a lawn league game against San Juan Hills, where the Lions won seven to six in a far a hard fought battle. Our female athlete of the year presented by JLC Associates is Holly Farmer from the softball team. <laughs>
Great job with the face paint there too, coach. Love that. All right, everybody, we did it. We're only an hour late. <laughs> we had a 7, 8, 7 p.m. goal. We got started a little bit late, though. That's all your all's fault, by the way. We didn't get started till almost 6, and it was supposed to start at 5. So I'm not taking the blame for this, Chris. You can't blame it on me. What a great night. Janet Evans, thank you so much. Evan, Janet Evans Wilson, uh, all the award winners, congratulations, and we'll see you all here next year. It'll be bigger and better next year. Thanks for coming out. Go Lions. We'll see you all later.